Hi, my name is Dalia Kikon and I am an anthropologist here at the University of Melbourne. And uh, today I would like to start a conversation by paying my respect and acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, elders past and present on which this meeting takes place. It gives me great privilege to invite uh, Dilprit Kaur Tagar today. She is a media officer at the Australia India Institute here in Melbourne. And I would like to welcome you, Dilprit, to this conversation that we're having. Given that you're an alumni of the University of Melbourne, Masters of Journalism, can you tell us something about what you're up to now in terms of your current work and your interests? Definitely. Thank you so much for having me, Dolly. Um, I do work as the media officer at the Australia India Institute, and I did graduate from the University of Melbourne doing my master's in journalism, but I'm working on a little passion project, if you may, which is called um, South Asian Today. It's a multimedia platform for South Asian women and non-binary folks and really giving them a platform for their own expression and so that they can take charge of their narrative and the conversation around their identity. So we launched on April 29, 2020, so super recent. We're just two months old, little babies. I'm so glad to know about this initiative because when it comes to, I think, having media platforms and digital platforms in terms of conversation, I think a focus on South Asian uh, mm. young people, both diaspora and in terms of, I think, international uh, community that we have in Australia, you know, around Melbourne included, is so important. And I really like your take on gender as well and the non-binary um, kind of inclusivity that's there. Can I ask you, how is it that your, your training at the university and in a, in a sense your uh, experience with the masters in journalism, just the community within the university help you with this vision? Um, I think my experience doing masters in journalism was really great and I think it really pushed me to launch South Asian today in the first place, but also it was sort of an eye opener. I think coming to Australia two years ago and not finding any autonomous space for South Asian expression was a bit bizarre and a bit surprising because I had heard that there was a huge migration and a huge community of South Asian um, you know, people in Australia. So not finding a space catered to our you know, observations and our conversations was a bit um, bizarre. Was I was a bit taken aback, if I'm honest. Can you tell us something about South Asian today and what's the layout? What do you focus on? For instance, right, people watching us and listening to us might be like, perhaps we want to send something. How would you, how would you pitch it? And, you know, like, what are the things you highlight? We actually do a lot. We are not restricted to one narrative. And that was a very conscious decision because we wanted to highlight all sorts of um, conversations and really give people of diverse backgrounds, um, you know, autonomy to really tell their stories on their own accord. But of course, there are some things that we are very um, particular about. We like to think we are very progressive. So anything anti-Black, anything homophobic, anything sexist will not get your work published. I think that's like my top priority because the space is for South Asians, but it's also for, you know, to push the conversation, to push the envelope and not fall into the same old um, cultural norms that are, that can be highly casteist, that can be highly Islamophobic. So I think it's a place for young South Asian women and non-binary folks to come together, engage, um, make videos, you can work on a video series, you can pitch a podcast, you can, you know, write a column for us. Um, we touch um, mental health, we touch gender issues, we touch race issues, we touch issues within India, for example, caste, class, um, how people from South Asia, when they come to Western countries, how they navigate. Because there's a huge difference between growing up brown in Australia and then coming to Australia as a brown person from, for example, India, right? So there's a huge difference between being a product of the diaspora and then becoming diaspora in your adult years. So to anyone who's listening, and if you're South Asian and if you're a woman or woman identifying or non-binary, I think I would say if you write anything um, which touches upon 
you know, really important conversations like race, gender, or pop culture. Please don't think that we are just always talking about race and gender. Sure, you can also talk about films and talk about the latest on Netflix. So it's a bit of both. It's also to platform South Asian writers and um, bloggers and video makers. Because if uh, a mainstream outlet is not going to publish your work, um, and there are a lot of reasons why that would happen, then I think South Asian Today is a great place for you to start. I think in terms of this conversation that we're having, right, given that this is a conversation that's allowing us to reach to a community, and by that community in the sense of both university students, staff, and the community that's out there, alumni, and the connections that we constantly try to make. For me, in my case, both you know, as a teacher, as staff within the university, and trying to understand what alumni are doing, and contributing to the community. I think your work is really important, I feel, in terms of thinking about what is a community. And you rightly say that because when, it, when we think about South Asia, it's a huge region, right? And both you and I come from India. India as a country is so big. I think it has the world's biggest population in terms of, I think, even understanding the diversity is sometimes mind-boggling. And I like how you make the connection in terms of looking at India and looking at Australia, I think you touched on some very important points, Dilpreet, about the diaspora, about first generation um, uh, students who are here trying to make, I think, a visible, important contribution like yourself, still working within, I think, one of uh, Australia, India's top think tank institute, the Australia India Institute, in terms mm -hmm. of work. and. You touch on some very important things, I think, that, that are very dear to both perhaps two countries. One is about diversity, right? Yeah. And I think, yeah, one is about diversity, and then you bring in how, even in terms of diversity, we need to be cautious about the homogeneous uh, presentation. Um, Absolutely. I think, I, I think this is for me as an anthropologist uh, coming from India, and of course, my key site is India. This is so important at this time that we are talking about uh, these important issues like race, um, mm -hmm. like color. From your training and you know, the founder of South Asian Today, can you tell us what are the stories that really shook you or touched you in a sense? So I think one thing that really shook me was um, the lack of representation of, for example, the Tamil community or Bangladeshi community or the Northeastern community, it's almost negligible. People don't even care to talk about their stories or to care, care about hiring writers from these particular communities. And that ends up being this one cute little Indian bubble that already exists. There is no pushing the envelope at all. So I think that really shook me in a way that I am also maybe part of the problem because I am Punjabi. So I am, maybe I'm also dominating a certain space and I need to sort of step back and make sure that whenever I accept a form of writing or I accept an artwork, you know, who's the artist? Because I don't want it to be one group taking over the space. So I think that's something that I'm constantly working with. And I was confronted when I started because um, I did realize that how we end up in this one bubble and how we need to like break it and have you know artists from Pakistan, Sri Lanka, the Tamil community, the Northeast community. Um, I think that was one of my biggest learning points. I think you touch upon a very uh, important point both in terms of I think at the intersections of diversity which includes yeah. the geopolitical region that we come from called South Asia. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time you know belonging to the biggest territory in South Asia, India. Yes. And and, and I think within that, you point out a very significant uh, tension in terms of when we say South Asia, just a predominance of uh, India, Indian expertise at times is overwhelming, right? Yes. And I think you, you rightfully say that. But I want to actually linger on the second very important point that you raise as well about India and the homogeneity of it. And I think even as educators, right? And because we're having an honest conversation, you know, I belong to the, the, the scheduled tribe community in India, uh, also known as Adivasis, indigenous to the land. 
Um, yep. And yet, you know, even as international staff here in Australia at the University of Melbourne, the, the way that even educational institutions at times fall into the trap for me is very telling, right? Uh, that, you know, within big institutions, we will only recognize one festival, right? It's Diwali. It's Diwali. Of course, it's Diwali. <laughs> It's the festival of lights and everyone's just so happy. Uh, they're all celebrating, not realizing that India is so diverse when it comes to religion. If, if I may ask you, uh, Dilpreet, I think in terms of your work at the Australia India Institute as a media officer, how do you, how do you see your role there? And, and in terms of, because you, on one hand, work for a very important, I think, serious think tank. And on the other hand, you're the founder of South Asian today. So how do you navigate that? Wow, you're really putting me on my on the spot, Dolly. <laughs> um, but yes, of course, that's that's a very important conversation. And these two aspects of my life are very much in contrast with one another because Australia India Institute is more academic and more about research publications, whereas South Asian today is political, social commentary. I do my role at Australia India Institute, and I um I've had the privilege to be in spaces that I probably otherwise would never be. And I think that's a big advantage. I probably would never attend the conferences that I did attend. And that gave me a different sort of insight that when two countries meet, in this example, Australia, India, there's not just political and social commentary and people go home. There are policies and um, strategies and you know the heavy stuff that goes into it, which I probably would never ever have thought about. So I think I am glad to, um, you know, have known some of the people and made connections that I did um, in the in the past year. But um, as you said, I think um, sometimes academic expression can be rigid and uh, might not want to push the envelope because things get political. So I think it's it's a bit of the both. I think I'm I'm in the middle of two very contrasting worlds. But that's interesting. I think I'm enjoying it. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you if um, you could give me an example of um, being an Indigenous Indian woman in Australia and doing academics at the University of Melbourne. Did you ever feel the need of um, more representation? Did you ever, maybe some incident you can share with me? Um, one thing has been actually the lack of understanding about India. Uh, yeah. by, 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 by people, I think, who claim to be experts on India and, uh, um, you know, and a lot of uh, I think researchers, um, professionals working here in Australia, including the University of Melbourne. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I am an Indian and I, I belong to the Naga community from Nagaland, mm -hmm. which is in Himalayas, uh, mm -hmm. and I come from a hill state, which is at yeah. a, a tri-junction of um, uh, India, China, and Myanmar. Mm -hmm. What I've often found amusing is that I, I speak more than five languages, including Hindi. But whenever wow. I go for meetings, uh, you know, all India strategy meeting, because I am currently the, the senior research, research advisor uh, at the Australian India Institute. But there's often, I think, a disjuncture between the face that I carry and you know, what an Indian should be. Uh, and so I've had really fascinating uh, experiences being international stuff here in Australia. And interestingly, not so much from Australians themselves, but I think from the Indian diaspora who are here, including the South Asian diaspora. I meet a lot of students from uh, across the region, given that you know, I have students from the AUSAID program and some amazing, I think, Australian government fellowships who come. In the body that I carry as somebody from India, it's always been a lifelong lesson. And I think it straight away speaks to Dilpreet, what you were saying about both the lack of understanding about India before we blame outsiders about you know, their lack of understanding. I think Indians themselves who claim both an expertise on that country, including a diaspora, have yes. very, very, uh, at times, I think limited understanding about where should be going and what we should be doing about this kind of diversity that we have. Um, I'm very amazed and very touched by the welcome to country that Australia, including the University of Melbourne and every place of work, both cultural, uh, educational, 
uh, political social spaces have adopted. That's mm -hmm. deeply touching. Mm -hmm. I have been here in Australia and I've been a staff at the University of Melbourne since 2016. And at times I hear debates, right? That is it just token that people are saying it or are they saying it from their hearts? Mm -hmm. But the fact that this is recognized, we are on indigenous land, is so deeply meaningful. So I think when we talk about South Asia as a region and also particularly India, I think the, 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 the process to learn about reconciling, the process to learn about healing, I think is so important. I do agree how important it is. You know, I'm absolutely not everything is perfect in Australia, but at least there's step zero. At least there is conversation around it, which we have not yet um, come to at all. And we really need to work on that. I really um, admire the conversations that's happening, right, outside the academy. And I think I want to come back to the point where you talk about the limitations of the academy. And I'm part of the academy, and I really respect and admire you for putting it out there. Mm -hmm. And I think this is so timely, because with the entire George Floyd murder that happened in the United States and the protests around the world, including mm -hmm. Australia, uh, my own discipline, anthropology, gosh, man, it's sipped in colonialism, right? It's sipped Absolutely. In, Absolutely. in white privilege. So in a sense, if we are not actually talking about decolonization, if we are not taking that as a serious approach, I think as academics, within the academy, we are in deep trouble. So, so Dilbert, I really wanted to ask you about then the South Asian uh, Today platform that you have. Uh, you are such a genius when it comes to digital technology. And I've seen you just like fly off with podcasts and you know, because we are colleagues at the Australian Indian Institute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how relevant or how important do you think the, the digital technology is going to be when it comes to dissemination of information and debates? And do you have a message for people out there, for instance, right, who are refusing to get into the digital space? Oh, okay. I think digital media is the only remaining form of media that is actually fearless when it comes to really political conversations. And if digital media was not there, then people like me would have, would be forced to work with these hierarchical forms of institutions that are run by upper caste, upper class Hindus, where they would never call out casteism, where they would never call out Islamophobia. And where would people like us go? So we have the the freedom and the ability to start our own platforms and push the conversation. So I was very conscious of not making South Asian Today print because then it really, you know, shrinks my uh, audience. I needed to be accessible by everyone. In closing, I would like to ask you uh, about future visions for South Asian Today. How do you see this platform coming with some of the uh, important uh, connections that we have in Australia, whether to do with the indigenous issues coming up to do with the race justice issues coming up. Does it have a space for that as well, for collaboration? Absolutely. Um, we're actually working on a whole corner on the website, which will be completely devoted um, and full of resources for settlers and South Asian settlers to learn about indigenous history of Australia. It will have uh, resources uh, for you to learn how to be an ally, um, how to give back to the community, how to pay your rent, which is so important. You need to pay your rent to at least one indigenous organization, especially, especially if you're a settler. And uh, we'll have, we will be celebrating all these indigenous artists and writers. You know, we'll have their bios. So it's going to be a whole hub of um, just indigenous excellence on South Asian today, which is so important. So it's also one of our ways to connect with the community we work on this land it's so important and also a way for us to use south asian platform to get south asian settlers to learn about the land that they're on and what they can do um, to be good allies and that's definitely a big big priority for me so definitely i think in the next couple of months we should be done um, putting it up and i'm actually very excited about that I'm equally excited and that's it. We, we are allies and this is a journey that we're going to take together. So it's been such a pleasure talking to you, uh, Debra. Yes. And thank you for your vision, your initiatives and for, for just, I think, being such a trailblazer.
So it's been a really wonderful, I think, session talking to you. So thank you so much. It was an absolute, absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye.